now we want to hear from the from the practitioners right from the government if if what we are doing or what we are we try to develop are, are making sense so um now we have uh, pak budi um in the room uh, and ibu yosi katarina and also pak franciscus harum um if you uh, if the three of you can turn on your video and then i, I will we, we will give each of the panelists uh, seven minutes to present and um the pabudi if you're ready i think we can start with your uh, your talking points go ahead pa. Uh, yeah so, selamat sore mbak ana terima kasih yeah, <laughs> yeah, mungkin, uh, Thank you, Anna, and good afternoon. I have uh, sent you the uh, material uh, to send to Kania, my presentation, but perhaps I'm going to uh, skip some uh, parts for the uh, in the interest of our time. Now, can you see my presentation? Yes. Thank you. So. I'm not going to repeat the background segment of my presentation since we've discussed that in earlier sessions. So what I would like to focus on in this presentation is the challenges for our way forward. Um, the work of a C4 team, uh, the, the question that you have is whether you can verify the CI that you have developed and verify their applicability in the field. And we also have seen the criteria and indicators. So going forward for uh, peatland, I see that there's there are increasing uh, challenges. We're also seeing more challenges in the 20, Newt Natsing Folu 2030 uh, that the president has uh, stated in the COP26, there's an increase of almost 5 million uh, hectares uh, for peatland. So this consists of deforestation and degradation control. That's also part of the NatSync uh, FOLU. And for concession uh, peatlands are located in either forestry or plantation concessions. Uh, we want to improve their hydrological management and governance as well as we also want to focus on the economic uh, approach um, in peatlands. And also important is sustainable peatland management uh, by utilizing uh, restoration, hydrological management, aquatic culture, uh, fisheries, and so on. And then under Article 6 of Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC, uh, the requirement is that for NDC's achievement, there should be international transfer of mitigation options. I think we need to then ensure robust and global standard CNI so that the calculations or, or measurements that we do in uh, evaluating emissions reduction is accurate, is clear and transferable at the international level. We've also heard from Ibu Mirna that BRGM is uh, developing this PHU model. And there are also questions about the institutional model of PHU, perhaps not a formal one. We can also consider other models, for example, forum uh, based. And we also heard from Ibu Mirna about consolidation in one PHU. And so we are seeing more challenges for CNI because each PHU is unique, also with different land use and the stakeholders that have access and rights to a PHU are varying. And so their roles and responsibilities are also different. So this PHU uh, model has been developed or articulated in the BRGM strategic plan until 2024. So the model will be uh, developed, implemented and monitored until 2024. Uh, we hope of course, this model can continue because part of the BRGM's work going forward is not only project implementation, but also to engage other stakeholders, especially for the purpose of funding, and activity, sustainability. And we want to transfer that in one complete uh, PHU 
where we can have both pragmatic and scientific approaches in a sustainable and long-term manner. And next is the practical use. We know that there are uh, tools of information that we can, or information that we can get from remote sensing technology. But we've heard that uh, field measurement is very important and primary data are important as well. And there have been approaches uh, developed since the uh, BRG. Uh, we work, we have been working with FAO to use their uh, system to measure, for example, moisture level. Uh, the moisture level that we gain from remote sensing can be verified by the Sipalaga station. So we have Sipalaga, the uh, information system to measure uh, water content of peat that can uh, measure the level of uh, water table in peatlands and to also measure rainfall. So what we see or visualized in spatial data can be verified uh, with measurement data generated by this tool. And this tool is automated. And so the information can be uh, accessed or can be seen in the peatland restoration and information system or PRIMS. Uh, there's a website page for PRIMS and you can also see the activities of BRGM, uh, who's doing what, uh, when the act an activity starts, as well as information of uh, before and after of an intervention. And we can see whether there's an increase in moisture for example, that we can measure using these tools as well as remote sensing technology. And in going forward, capacity building and institutional support are important because we've heard about tier one, who's going to do tier one or who is capable to uh, implement tier two um, verifiers. But it's also very important to make sure that the local uh, community can also access this information especially in uh, periods where uh, it, it's more prone to beat fire. So the key message is the science of restoration is growing and including the sophistication of CNI, that the practical use of CNI that can address the needs as well as the different um, level knowledge of the communities are very uh, important to consider as well. Uh, perhaps to uh, respond to Pak Harry's uh, point about the nesting approach, I think it's something that we, uh, it's a good idea to consider. And the level of nested or information or how we can manage um, CNI that will need uh, more uh, development, uh, focusing on capacity building, focusing on the tools or the methodology or uh, process to assess the indicators and data that we can use as verifiers. And we also going forward, we need to have robust and globally accepted CNI for high quality offset to NDC commitment. We've also heard about uh, funding can that can be a challenge. Uh, so it's, the question is, can peat uh, restoration get funding from carbon offset? But of course, uh, to determine carbon offset, we need accurate and robust information and also uh, globally accepted. And for the purpose of global or carbon uh, transfer in Indonesia and globally. So global recognition is very important. And we are uh, thankful that this webinar uh, also has uh, global participants or international participants. Uh, this kind of information exchange uh, platform is uh, very important so that the work of scientists can be uh, included in negotiations and decision-making processes. And we've also heard from uh, some of the questions as well as our previous panelists uh, comments about flexibility, reliability, and attainability. attainability. Flexibility uh, doesn't mean we compromise robustness. And at the same time, reliability uh, also needs to 
uh, meet global uh, standard can be verified and attainability uh, means information can be attained uh, implemented and can be easily uh, used or in decision making uh, mechanisms and the last key message is that continuous consultation between practitioners and researchers are uh, vital to response to growing needs of ci thank you anna thank you pa budi thank you for being uh, on time seven minutes and the message is i think uh, we need to be flexible but without compromising robustness it's a challenge but it's something that we have to uh, think about going forward and the next uh, speaker the next panelist is uh, ibu yosi katarina hi thank you so following on the footsteps of pak budi i'm also going to deliver my contribution in bahasa indonesia so as ibu anna uh, mentioned that we have potential uh, users and you want you want to get input from potential users i want to make clear that i'm not from the government i'm in the USAID, I'm the environmental governance lead in the USAID cigar project. So we're helping uh, BAPANAS, the National Development Agency of Indonesia to create or to develop a set subset of indicators. And pa Henry previously talked about uh, scale and we this, our scale is to measure the performance of a uh, agency or, or kabupaten uh, in their sustainable plantation communities i think to a certain extent uh, i see some relevant experiences that i can share in this uh, platform that can contribute to uh, improving or, dis or enriching this discussion the uh, topic i know is the utilization of ci i did not uh, prepare a, a special presentation because Daniel confirmed that I didn't need to, but I think that I can show you this one slide from Bapanas and I feel can be valuable to give you an overview of institutionalization for Terpercaya project. So Terpercaya has gone through all of the phases uh, that BRGM and C4 uh, are going through so we have done the trial in 2021 we went through our third um, phase we develop relevant policies we also developed the market instruments uh, we've heard about this um, as well in the previous uh, section and we also focus on multilateral cooperation as part of the project to make sure that our indicators are adopted in multilateral cooperation So in this process, we use a theoretical uh, framework developed by uh, Sinclair. And based on the theoretical framework, we see there are three, uh, identify three approaches uh, to develop a set of regulations. From, uh, we have command and control, economic instruments, and others. And others would uh, include self-regulation, uh, and information strategies. So I want to cover three areas or three uh, important key takeaways from the Percaya process. One is to select approach or combination of approaches that uh, Gunningham Sinclair uh, developed. And these approaches serve as the overarching framework for the criteria and indicators. And to select which is the best approach or combination of approaches, we know that there are instruments that can help us reaching our dis uh, decision, for example, dynamic modeling. But the challenge is in the context of Indonesia, data availability or data quality is not optimal as we've heard from other speakers. And as the result, the modeling or the outcome of the modeling may not be very accurate. And that's why in the Indonesian context, we use piloting as the method that we rely on to test the policy that we want to develop. 
So to determine the approach, uh, Harry earlier mentioned that there uh, are key questions. Uh, and for me, it, to be uh, honest, I'm still also trying to grasp this whole process. Uh, for example, the goal of the indicators and who are expected to use the indicators. Is this a policy instrument that you want BRGM to use to direct the local government, for example, or to uh, guide villages? Or is this uh, BRGM's internal evaluation to assess the effectiveness of their interventions? And the next question is who's going to conduct the evaluation? Is it going to be uh, done based on uh, fresh or primary uh, data? We've heard about this from uh, Ibu Anna and team uh, looking for the verifiers, or will the process rely on aggregated uh, data from uh, other institutions? And then who will then supply the data? For example, at the village level, who's going to capture or record the data, district level, or uh, perhaps directly on the field by teams like Baana's uh, or Ibu Anas team. And knowing that local governments are now uh, flooded by data requests, then what we can do is to use data proxies from national level government because local government would also forward their data to their relevant line ministries. Now the policy is then how we, can we ensure that the data from local government transferred to the line ministries can be uh, translated and standardized by BAPANAS and that is why we have the one data policy. So these are the things that should help uh, institu institutionalizing indicators. The other question is who will be affected by these indicators? in all sense, uh, including uh, the uh, data uh, collector, or uh, perhaps we have target of behavior changes because of the data uh, collection. I think these uh, questions need to be answered first before we can determine which approach that we want to take to institutionalize the indicators. At the policy level, we know that as Pak Heri also uh, mentioned, as well as Pak Budi also mentioned this, there are three uh, things that are usually considered primarily by the government in developing policy regulatory basis, the institutional setup. These are uh, do two different things like Pak Heri mentioned, and then the funding or the budget. I believe that these have uh, elements have been considered by the team that will work with BRGM in developing or institutionalizing these indicators going forward. And there are two other uh, things that are very important in my learning process. One is how do we communicate this idea to the public so that the public under, can understand these indicators? Because we know that all so many indicators out there that are being implemented by different institutions with different uh, goals as well. And the second, uh, also very important is we need to have uh, some kind of task force that is uh, part perhaps in the policy making in BRGM that can consistently work with stakeholders. Because the first uh, step it will not be perfect and we may see many adjustments as we respond to market situation, to regulatory situation and so on. And that is why we need to have a task force within BRGM that work alongside stakeholders to continuously refine this set of CI. And so don't uh, expect that uh, on the get-go that you will get everything perfect, especially as we know the situation in Indonesia and the diversity in Indonesia. And But if we have in place a, a mechanism to capture ideas or plan to make sure that the indicators are uh, consistently uh, refined, I believe that is a very important uh, thing to consider. So that's it, uh, Mbak Anna. Hopefully this has been beneficial to you. Thank you.
uh, we also agree in our team, we agree and we have uh, started uh, questioning on who's going to use the indicators, who's going to do uh, indicator measurement, where can we get the data and so on. And I think this uh, confirms what do we need uh, to do in the fo going forward. So thank you so much, Ibu Yossi. And ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, we you can raise them in the chat box. I'm also trying to monitor our chat box uh, conversations. And while we're doing that, we also have uh, the final presentation from uh, Yasin. Are you there? Okay. I hope you can hear my audio. Thank you. Thank you. You have seven minutes. My apology, Mbak Anna. I just use my colleague laptop. And I'm not sure how I can share my screen from my laptop. Or perhaps you can send me your file, your presentation file. Allow me to send you my presentation file. But you see, did you say something? I was about to mention that I had to join another meeting. So if there is any question raised to me, we can keep in touch. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Mas Yasin, I hope you, you have received my PowerPoint presentation file. Sorry for the technical glitch. This is the last presentation. So I will, I might repeat several points that have been touched upon by previous speakers. Prof. Gusti Ansari has mentioned about the indicator of damage to pitland ecosystem. So we have the criteria regarding pitland ecosystem damage. There are five criteria. The first one, exposed sediment, reduction of the area of coverage, and the criteria area in terms of the, the water table. We, looking at this criteria, we have formulated what to do. So in BRGM, we are developing the concept of three R, reweighting, revegetation, and okay, the first R is reweighting. So this reweighting is conducting to maintain the water level in the pitland ecosystem to maintain the function of the pitland ecosystem. So after building the infrastructure, we also conduct the operations and maintenance. And the second R is the revegetation. The what we would like to maintain is the water level in the pitland ecosystem. So most of the pitland is receiving the source of water coming from the rainfall or precipitations of water. So therefore, we will maintain the water from the existing canal canals and the second R is revegetation and the last R, the third R is revitalization. The revitalization is the community empowerment. It's more on the economic aspect. So we agree as what has been mentioned by Anna, Meli, and Chakim. In terms of the criteria of indicators, in addition to biophysical indicator, we also have social, economic, and governance aspect. The third R in this case is more on the social and economy. And as for the governance, we have um, it land villages, Desa Peduli Gambut. It is on how we can mainstream, mainstream all of the elements in the utilizations of pitland and incorporate that into the village governance in the village level and also the local government level. And as for the monitoring itself, 
we have heard from Pak Budi that we have rims here, so you can check that in the https prims.brg.go.id so you will be able to see the indicators coming from the existing canals the fire area the land clearing area so you'll be able to see those in real time in addition to prims we also have sipalaga www.sipalaga.brg.go.id so we have sensors here and in the chat box pak nyoman Mr. Nyoman has mentioned also, in addition to the water table, we also need to see the preci precipitation level. And we have homerogen pitland. And the water table plays a very important role in relation to the precipitations or rainfall. So we'll be able to see the category level in line with the rainfall level and we have implemented 100 we will add 30 units and our hope is that with these indicators we will be able to see the level of damage and the level of effectiveness of what we have implemented so far in addition to that we can we also conduct the assessment of the canal blocking that we have implemented or we have uh, constructed so we do the assessment in some location we've seen some damages to the canal blocking as we know there might be some some challenges and also damages caused by natural aspect and also made-made cost and we conduct improvement or repair to the damage that is happening and out of these three r and also the assessment regarding the canal blocking the second r and the third r which is revitalization so we also look at the qualitative and quantitative assessment the percentage of growth in line with the regulation the level of success of revegetation is 500 plants per hectares and for the third r we also conduct assessment in the community for the developed business we also provide some empowerment to level up the value of the products produced by the communities and this is the key message important learning from what we have done so far the first one in pitland restoration we can see that the regulations of the pitland was issued in 2014 so previously earlier than that pitland had been used by concessions and small holders and you can see some are protected pitlands and other types of pitland so there are 12 million hectares of pitland it's very wide and even wider than java island in terms of the area and the next one is less effective partial restorations in the protected area and therefore we can see that in terms of the hydrological aspect of the pitland for more effectiveness we need to look at the landscape of the pitland itself the next one it is not only biophysical restoration but we also need to look at the social economic and institutional aspect so this is something to adopt so perhaps we can also test this one in the phu that we're going to work on and then this is concerning the phu from the learnings that we have taken from what have been done so far in the phu management there should be a multi stakeholders collaboration so phu cannot be done in silo there needs to be an engagement of many parties local governments 
and other stakeholders. So this is the concept to be offered. So to see how much is the degradation in the PHU, the damage level, degradation level, and we will determine the purpose of the PHU. For example, in a particular PHU, the most dominant one is the land fire or forest fire that and cause damage to pitland ecosystem. So we will map the purposes. So each stakeholder purpose, so we will map their purposes and goal. And also we will collect the commitment of all stakeholders, for example, to achieve the goal of zero burning. There must be programs re relevant to the zero burning goal, the pros and cons in line with the determined goal. So this is something that we are working on. The next one is, so these are the PHUs, that there are seven PHU that we have determined. And uh, Mas Yasin, my apology, your time remaining is 30 seconds. Perhaps you can wrap up your presentation. So there are several typologies, uh, island PHU in the cas in, has, in Siak Kampar. Um, most are owned by companies, some are owned by um, regencies, so some PHUs will be used as a pilot model for the PHU management. And here, we are very happy to have heard from previous speakers, and if we are able to implement this indicator and criteria, we'll be able to see which to improve in terms of the criteria from the aspect of governance, social, economy, or biophysical aspect to define this model uh, PHU. So perhaps this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for giving me more time. So yeah, that's a very important thing. The last message is about collaboration, collaboration to develop and to enhance the criteria and indicators and to see in which aspect we can conduct improvement and all of the indicators and verifiers. Thank you so much, Pak Budi, for your presentation. Mas Yasin, thank you so much. And Mbak Josie as well. Without further ado, due to the time constraint, I would like to give the floor to Rupes. Is it you, Rupes? 